Hi everyone, and welcome to our final feedback session with Ian, Siobhan and Caroline. This week you were asked to analyze three images. The first one was a contemporary video by a French artist, Siobhan. Why did you select this work? I chose this video because I've shown it a few times at conferences and with school groups as well, and um, people usually enjoy it and find that it speaks to them. It's also a good way of triggering a debate about integration in France. I also chose this video because it's a good example of the ways this kind of work can seem quite simple at first, but then actually raise more complex questions as we think about it further, either with or without the additional details and various interpretations supplied by texts. Some students commented on how simple, even banal, the piece was, and it's true that when you first watch it, it can seem to make quite a simple statement about how France should accept its immigrants, but then it starts to raise other questions about French identity and integration, and also about how we view and represent other cultures. In this case, it also raised some important questions, I think, about the role of art and its relationship to politics. So some thought it was perhaps offensive to use French national symbols in this way, while others saw the use of these symbols as part of that attempt to balance the different cultures to which the artist belongs. The work also raised questions regarding the relationship between the work of art and the viewer, and about how, how art functions differently um, from verbal texts. Thanks, Siobhan. There were many different interpretations of the piece and some learners found it ambiguous and confusing. Should an art have a clear meaning? Mm. Some interpreted Zulika Buebdala's video to be about a clash of cultures. Others saw it as being about intercultural harmony or at least compatibility. Some think the video reinforces cliches while other th others think it challenges them. And it certainly is ambiguous, both meanings are there. Perhaps the artist aims to show us that those cliches and stereotypes exist, while also imagining a way of going beyond them. A few of our students commented on the way the dancing and the music don't seem to go well together. Um, a staged film of a professional belly dance might have evoked intercultural harmony, but this slightly out of sync spontaneous dance perhaps points to the tension between cultures. The artist attempts to balance the culture she belongs to, but this is a difficult balancing act. So that helps to, to explain that. Our student Lisa put it very well when she said that the dance illustrated the idea that the process of integration, of balancing our cultural identities, isn't always smooth and graceful, but is dynamic. But perhaps the main thing the work does, because of its ambiguity, is open the debate about France and its relationship to other cultures, and perhaps also wider debates about the representation of women. Works of art often change meaning as they're viewed in different contexts by different people. Quite a number of our students very effectively related their interpretations of this video to their own cultural affiliations or experiences, and some imagined how this piece might be viewed differently by someone in France. I was also very interested to see that some thought about the piece in relation to events that have taken place in the years since the work's production in 2003, for example, the, the Charlie Hebdo attacks, of course. This work also shifts in meaning when it changes format and is accompanied by various texts. The work can be interpreted in different ways when we know about the different sources of inspiration for the artist. The DVD version, for example, supplies these details in a text. I think many contemporary works of art work like this. They work in one way when you first experience them, and then further layers of meaning are added as you read the accompanying notes, then the catalogue, reviews and other texts. So, so the piece can work without these texts, but in a different way. It's interesting that many artists exploring the theme of cross-cultural identity often choose not to supply a text with the work. They seem deliberately to engage a diverse public with different cultural backgrounds, religious beliefs, or, or political convictions, and their use of cultural symbols or objects can provoke some strong reactions. I think that often these works of art are intended to say more about the viewers than what's being viewed. Thanks, Siobhan. The next image of the week was the map of the Habsburg Empire. Ian, some learners were very struck by the animated graphic representing the Habsburg Empire through history, and this led to a comparison with other empires, for example, Roman and Colonial Empire of the Spanish and British were referred to. How useful are these comparisons? I suppose that, like all comparisons, they 
do have the useful points and they do illustrate and illuminate different points about the different empires, but they can at times also obscure some key differences. The thing to say about the Habsburg Empire in 1914 is that it wasn't a colonial empire like the British or Spanish Empire. Um, there have been some attempts to explain the Habsburg Empire with reference to post-colonial theories, uh, in particular uh, with regard to Bosnia-Herzegovina. But it seems to me many of these attempts have been overstretched and not very persuasive. The important thing is that the Habsburg Empire was outdated. It was autocratic. There was a belated attempt to become democratic, um, which is what's portrayed in the, in the text by Mark Twain that, that we put in, in the course. The Habsburg Empire wasn't an empire of military conquest. Franz Josef himself was a poor military leader and his armies repeatedly failed on the battlefield. The way to see him, I think, is as someone who was dull and dutiful and playing a role. The important thing is that his reign was incredibly long. He was born before the age of steam, before there was electricity, and yet he ended his reign in, in a war where there was mechanised warfare, tanks and explosives and modern technology. He was a living anachronism, uh, a monarch by divine right ruling subject peoples. But from that anachronism there was also a sense of the monarch's obligation towards the peoples he ruled, and from that sprang the kind of accommodation that I described between the different languages of the empire. It's ironic, in fact, that it was Franz Ferdinand who was assassinated, because Franz Ferdinand was the, the individual who had a plan to redesign the empire to give the South Slavs, in particular the Serbs and the Bosnians, a greater degree of autonomy. Overall, it's important not to idealise this vanished empire. There were plenty of instances of violent repression, um, of popular movements, for example. Some of our learners this time pointed out that it was the Habsburgs who eliminated the Czech ruling class and the Czech intellectuals, uh, which were then built up again in the course of the 19th century and early 20th century, only to then be destroyed by the Soviet Empire after 1945. Thanks, Ian. In our discussion topic about multilingualism versus monolingualism, there were many contributions from learners on the relationship between minority languages and a dominant official language. How do you see this? In the responses and the way the learners talk about themselves, we can see a view that multilingualism as a personal project is generally regarded as something beneficial. Many of our learners write with a great deal of passion and, and openness about their successes and failures and knowledge of, of other languages. I'd quote the American philosopher John Searle on this. Um, he puts it like this. He says, you can never understand one language until you understand at least two. At the same time, speakers of minority languages often face uh, political and economic realities that prevent them from accessing um, greater opportunities, which can only be accessed if one speaks a more widely spoken language. So at a personal level, it can be the case that the preservation of a minority language um, conflicts with aspirations to travel, with aspirations to gain better employment opportunities, and so on. We have some examples of determined efforts to preserve and even reawaken minority languages, but the evidence for their successes is quite mixed. Some of our learners referred to efforts, um, for example, with regard to Welsh in the UK. Now, despite increased support from government, despite a largely sympathetic approach in recent years, the number of first language speakers of Welsh has not grown. So in the long term, the fate of languages spoken by smaller numbers of people is uncertain. I'd put it this way, the lesson of Austria-Hungary is that all states must find ways to recognise and accommodate the interests of linguistic minorities if government is to be effective and survive in the long term. And if that was true for an autocratic monarchy like Austria-Hungary, it's even more true for modern democracies. Looked at from the other side, the problem is um, that the lingua franca, the assumed common language, like the German or Hungarian of the Habsburg Empire or the English of our globalised 21st century is seldom in itself neutral. I'd like to finish with a comment from one of our learners, Kimberly, who writes, learning and speaking a foreign language is more than forming grammatically correct sentences. True fluency, she says, depends on context, 
experiencing the language in conjunction with its culture, studying things such as slogans, books, statutes and, statues and images which inform a specific culture, as we've done, increases our understanding of both the language and the culture, as well as their place on the world stage. And I suppose if we'd hoped for anything with our debate on multilingualism versus monolingualism, it was exactly this kind of insight. Thanks, Ian. The last image of the week was a 16th century cloth painting from Mexico. Caroline, you noted that there were more comments than questions relating to the Lienzo this week, in particular from learners for whom an understanding of the participation of indigenous peoples in the conquest of Mexico and Guatemala was new. Can you tell us a bit more about the alliances that indigenous peoples forged with Europeans? Um, yes, there were plenty of comments to this effect this week, including those from Nigel, who said that he was not previously aware of the alliances made by the Spanish at the time. Beryl, who quite rightly noted that the Lienzo de Cuauquecholan shows us that the history of colonization is not as straightforward as popular narratives would lead us to believe. And Darlene, who pointed out that the narratives we tend to hear present Europeans as either discovering and then civilizing the Americas, or conquering and then destroying Amerindian populations. And all comments are really about how the Lienzo helps us grasp the complexity of the processes of conquest and colonization, and how it cautions us against simplistic interpretations. So to provide a bit more context, I thought it would be helpful to direct learners to another Lienzo um, about which we know much more, and which serves both as a useful point of comparison, but also corroboration of the extent to which in, uh, Europeans depended on um, indigenous allies to establish colonial rule over native policies in the Americas. Uh, this is the Lienzo de Trascala, which was copied multiple times during the colonial period, um, and which tells the story of the Trascala Spanish alliance uh, that was initiated at the beginning of um, the conquest period in Mexico specifically to defeat the Aztec Empire. And this was perhaps the single most important alliance that the Spaniards established, as it enabled them not only to secure control of central Mexico, um, but also to fan out from that uh, base uh, in all directions, including Guatemala, where the Trashcalans also participated alongside the Cualquechalteca. Like the Cuauque Cholteca, the Lienzo de Trascala also depicts the establishment of an alliance with Spaniards in the initial scene and shows this to have been a friendly first encounter, although we know from the records that it was far from friendly an encounter. It similarly presents the Spanish Trascalan alliance as one of equals and Spaniards and Trascalans as co conquerors, in some images reflected in the uh, larger size compared with those they conquered, as well as in their more elaborate insignia. Another similarity with the Cuauquecholan um, lienzo is that the key protagonists are Spaniards, Trashcalans, and those that their combined forces defeated. There was no place here either to acknowledge the participation of other allied groups, reminding us that one of the key purposes of the lienzos was to show these groups as conquerors, not as conquered, deserving the same recognition, status, and rights and privileges awarded to Spanish conquistadors in the new political order that emerges in the wake of conquest. In some cases, Trascala being the most notable, they secured a high degree of autonomy under colonial rule and successfully protected it into the 18th century. What this doesn't address, of course, is the question of why so many groups, indigenous groups, allied uh, with um, Spaniards against their own people. And what we need to remember is that while Spaniards and subsequently other Europeans used the term Indio or Indian to refer to all the new peoples they encountered in the Americas, they thought of themselves as members of distinct communities, city-states, kingdoms, and indeed ethnicities with distinct interests and agendas. In the case of Mexico, many such groups had been incorporated into the empire of the Aztecs, and many chafed under Aztec imperial control. So this is part of the context for understanding why groups like the Trashcalans and Cuauquechalteca allied with the invader against people we see as their own, but which they didn't. <laughs> 
And this in turn also helps us understand how and why they sought to exploit the new opportunities um, to advance their interests in the exceptionally challenging political environment created by the arrival of the Spaniards. Thanks, Caroline. Another of our learners asked whether there are sources to confirm the cooperation between the Quaker Cholteca and the Spanish. In other words, can the Lienzo be trusted as a record? Um, this was Maria Cristina who picked up on what I said in the MOOC about there being little in the way of documentary evidence from the period and asks um, whether there is corroboration in other sources. Um, well, it is true that there are a few contemporaneous documentary sources, we do know that some five to 6,000 Mexican allies accompanied Jorge de Alvarado in his 1527 campaign to Guatemala. We also know that of those who survived the campaigns, and many didn't, um, the majority settled in Mexican barrios or neighborhoods uh, close to Spanish settlements in the Guatemalan highlands and did not return to Mexico. Indeed, Laura Matthews, who has carried out extensive research on the subsequent history of uh, Mexican conquistadors in Guatemala, shows that they settled in Almolonga or Ciudad Vieja, represented in the Lienzo itself by the glyph for Agua Volcano, um, near which these settlements were founded. And we know from documentary sources in the 1560s and 1570s um, that these indigenous conquistadores and, of course, by now their descendants, not only of the Cuauhtémoc Cholteca, but also of other Mexican groups, repeatedly petitioned the Spanish crown to protect the privileges that they had gained as recompense for their contributions to conquest, and which by this time they felt were not being respected. In addition to petitions from indigenous peoples themselves, there exist numerous testimonies from Spaniards, uh, Spaniards who fought alongside Mexican conquistadors, attesting to the role they had played uh, in conquest campaigns in Guatemala, and a role that proved indispensable, and they acknowledged to have been indispensable uh, to the Spaniards. So can we trust it as a source? We can certainly trust it as a source, um, but we also need to read it with the same care as we would read a chronicle uh, or a, um, uh, an alphabetic source uh, written by um, Spaniards. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you all for your additional feedback. Thank you, learners, for engaging with our course so fully. This is all from us. See you all on our next cultural adventure.